Well, anyway, Marion made some notable gains to be sure. For instance, she took first place in a singing contest among 300 singers, winning an appearance with the New York Philharmonic Orchestra. She gave several recitals at both Town Hall and Carnegie Hall, and also sang with the Philadelphia Orchestra. However, she was still being deprived of the singing engagements that would further her career. Finally convinced that she could not build a career in the country of her birth, she sailed off to Europe, where she continued her studies in voice and in languages. Now, while studying in Berlin, Germany, she met Ruhl Rasmussen, a Norwegian concert manager, and also Kosti Vihainen, a brilliant Finnish pianist, who you see here at the piano. Now, they were traveling through Europe together, looking for new professional talent. Well, that meeting turned out to be one of the turning points of Marion's career. For with Rasmussen as manager and Vihainen as accompanist, she embarked upon a sensationally successful European tour, giving recitals throughout all of Scandinavia, as well as in such countries as England, France, Spain, Italy, and Russia. Well, with a triumphant European tour behind her, she was ready once more to tackle America. So home she sailed. And you know, soon she was performing concerts in cities all over the United States with her thrilling contralto voice and her, her wonderful musical talent and, well, just herself. She was beginning to draw the attention of people as never before. Now, at that time, Marion's concert tours were being managed by Saul Hurok, one of America's top concert managers. And the Hurok office had made arrangements for Marion to perform a concert in Washington, D.C. at Constitution Hall. Well, everything seemed in order until the owners of the hall, who were the daughters of the American Revolution, known as the DAR, a nationwide patriotic organization for women, suddenly decided that their hall could not be used by a black performer. Well, that didn't sit too well with Mr. Hurok. But I don't understand your reasoning. Unless, of course, the DAR is an organization of bigots. But... But... I know, but the publicity has gone out. Tickets have been sold. The, the way things look, we'll fill the hall. But what you're doing is absolutely unethical. You made a commitment. We have a solid business agreement. Besides, Marian Anderson happens to be one of the finest singing artists in the... That's it? That's your final answer? And you call yourselves patriots? Reports of the DAR's action leaked out. Newspapers all over the nation headlined the news. Well, after all, Marian Anderson was fast becoming one of the world's most famous concert singers. What's more, she was black. Everywhere she went, she was besieged by reporters. How do you feel about it? Are you insulted? Do you believe your career has been damaged because of it? Are you angered by this rejection? What do you intend to do about it? Do you consider this a slap against the black race? Will you fight the DAR? Do you intend to make any statement at this time or any other time, Miss Anderson? What are your future plans? Eleanor Roosevelt, the first lady of the nation, angrily resigned from the DAR because of its action against Marion. Well, the situation grew, picked up momentum, snowballed until it became a full-blown national controversy. And then it happened. Several high-ranking government officials, reacting to the cries and clamor of an aroused public, decided that Marion Anderson should indeed sing in Washington, D.C. And they invited her to appear on Easter Sunday in the open, singing from the Lincoln Memorial before as many people as would care to attend. Well, news of this proposal spread like wildfire throughout the country, and there were pros and cons on the idea. Many thought Marion should not lower herself to sing outside, arguing that it was a, a, a humiliating compromise, and others thought it was a, a great idea. Marion herself, well, she had mixed emotions, fearing that such an occasion might take the wrong direction, that it might backfire, become an ugly white-black confrontation. I studied my conscience and came to the conclusion that my significance as an individual was small in this affair. I had become, whether I liked it or not, a symbol representing my people. I had to appear. 
Upon a platform built for the occasion mingled many prominent national leaders. When it was time to begin, Marion stepped to the microphone and looked out over a crowd of some 75,000 people. My head and heart were in such turmoil that I looked and hardly saw. I listened and hardly heard. All I felt then was the overwhelming impact of that vast multitude. There seemed to be people as far as the eye could see. I had a feeling that a, a great wave of goodwill poured out from these people, engulfing me. And when I stepped forward, I felt for a moment as though I was choking. For a desperate second, I thought the words would not come. Oh, the words came all right, along with all of the notes, magnificently. In time, the policy at Constitution Hall changed, and Marian Anderson, as well as other black artists, performed there regularly. The years that followed for Marian were busy ones filled with achievement. She made more tours throughout Europe, South America, and the United States, singing at the White House several times, as well as for the King and Queen of England. Along the way, she met and befriended such famous people as the great conductor Arturo Toscanini, the renowned Finnish composer, Jean Sibelius, and the scientific genius Albert Einstein. During World War II, she entertained Allied troops at many military bases and sang for the wounded in hospitals and on hospital ships. Throughout her career, Marian Anderson received honors from governments, honorary degrees from universities, humanitarian awards from organizations. She was elected to the Women's Hall of Fame, and lest we forget, in 1943, married her childhood sweetheart, Orpheus H. Fisher, whom she lovingly called King. Everyone has their favorite songs. I have many. But perhaps the most precious of all is the spiritual. He has the whole world in his hands. Now this hymn reminds us not to lose sight of the fact that we have our times of, well, grief and despair and that there is a being who can help at such times. And you know, it, it takes in everybody. He's got you and me, brother, in his hands. He's got you and me, sister, in his hands. He's got everybody here in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. The preceding program was made possible by a grant from the Ohio Department of Education.
This is WVIZ TV 25. Need something 